you know, from my standpoint, my, you know, my customers are the are feedlots, you know, that's who I'm selling to. And I think they're going to start to rely on this information pretty heavily at some point. They're going to look at this and be able to predict what these calves are doing. And so if you can show them, you know, the genetic merit of your herd and the calves that you're trying to sell them, I think they're going to be worth a whole lot more to those feeders than a calf that either isn't, you know, doesn't have those traits or they don't know. Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversation podcast, where we talk about all things related to ranching by connecting you to peer ranchers and industry leaders to improve the profitability of your operation and your lifestyle. Now, if you are looking for a community of ranchers, sign up for my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are mastermind events for ranchers. You join a Zoom link and you sit down and have a conversation with other ranchers and industry leaders about specific topics that help you improve your operation and face the challenges that we face as an industry as a whole. Now, if you want immediate ranch management advice, go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com slash newsletter and sign up. When you sign up, I will send you a free PDF with 22 ranch management tips from the ranching gurus who have been on my show and poured out their knowledge for all to hear. With that, be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram by following Cattle Convos. You can connect with me there or you can go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com to find anything you may need. I'm excited to meet you and let's get on with the show. All right, folks. Well, we're here today with Craig Bieber and John Price. And if you want to hear a conversation about genetics, especially as a commercial cattleman, I mean, we're going to be talking about genetics as a whole, but specifically the value they provide for commercial cattlemen and some ways to maximize that value today. So I'm going to start off and I want Craig and John, I would like each of you to kind of introduce yourself, talk a little bit about what you do, but share with the audience, you know, the the value of genetics on your operation and how you view that component of ranch management in your daily lives. So John, let's start with you. Uh, So yeah, John Price, uh, (laughs) we run about 700 normally, 700 commercial, mostly red Angus cows. They're pretty high percentage. Uh, They aren't registered, but, uh, but very high percentage. We have uh, we keep all our own replacement heifers. Do a, a little bit of a lot of AI work and a little bit of uh, um, bull selection, and you know that way as well with some AI stuff to to do some of our replacement stuff that way. Um, so in doing so, we've we've uh, kind of embraced the DNA testing and the genetic testing to help you know just to to give a leg up, I guess, on on finding the good genetics. Um, so we've been doing that probably for, I don't know, eight, eight or nine years now, I believe some, somewhere in that neighborhood. So, um, well, great. And so where are you located at? We're in Deer, uh, Deer Trail, Colorado, Eastern Colorado, about an hour East of Denver, kind of on the plains of Colorado. So, well, great. Thank you. So Craig, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Craig Bieber, Bieber at Angus Ranch, uh, located in Leola, South Dakota, uh, we we run about 900 cows. Um, we also put in a bunch of embryos and sell about oh, four to 500 bulls a year um, and actually growing. I mean, there's been years when we've actually even sold 600. We've been uh, DNA testing since 2011 um, and we've we've felt it was a lot of value. Um, you know, we didn't start doing everything. We started doing uh the all of the females and or most of the females and half of the bulls and now we're in a program where we're testing everything uh matter of fact even this year we're going to test some dead calves which will be an interesting conversation later that will be interesting so craig i know you have registered and you have commercial cattle too so do you want to talk about you know how you're managing with genetics on both sides of your operation. 
So we don't run any commercial cow shea. Mm-hmm. I, okay. We only run registered cows. We do we do help customers move uh, or when we can move females. But we 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 we've been a big believer in genomically enhanced EPDs. Um, you know, I think it's really moved selection uh, forward faster. Um, you know, you look at the tables that they have, and if it's, you know, the first thing that's really convinced me, I guess, if I back up a little bit, is that I thought our Cavanese predictions could be more spot on if we were getting, you know, roughly 10 to 20 head progeny uh, equivalents out of, out of DNA. And so we, we started testing early on for that reason, but it found a lot of other advantages to, to, to a host of traits, particularly the growth traits. And I think it's coming along on fertility traits as well. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that and explaining that. So John, going back to you, when you look at, you know, doing this testing and getting that information back, what's the main value you've seen from it as you've began implementing that? So it's kind of hard to put a put a finger on exactly the main value. There's been a lot a lot of values to it. It uh, we get you know a lot of information on all of the different you know all the different EPD traits. Even though they're you know these are commercial cows, so they're not a true EPD number, but it still gives us that uh, you know that that measurement of those same fields. So it's just allowed us to. I think move those, you know, to really fine tune that selection and really find that better performing genetics, you know, whether it's most of the time in our females, um, we test all of our females, every one of them and pick all of our replacements pretty much based just on those numbers. Obviously we still look at the animals and, and, you know, we, we kick some of them out for, for phenotypic reasons as well, but, um, but the, but the numbers all have to be there. And so it's allowed, it's allowed us to, what I've really seen in my cow herd is, is you know, really bringing our cow size down um, substantially and still, you know, really not losing very much in weaning weight. So, you know, I can't really give you an exact number as far as a return on that, but it's, it's substantial and it's there because we've, like I said, we've really been able to moderate that cow size and, and still maintain a weaned calf that isn't much smaller than what we were doing, you know, with a much larger cow. So, so that's been the big value to us. I think, it, you know, it's, it's just starting to kind of show up. I think we'll see some, hopefully some increased, you know, longevity. We'll see how some of the stability numbers play out. I think they're, you know, the, the hope is that, that that will get better as well, that, you know, all those things, the, the breeding of our heifer, heifers will, you know, they'll breed up better with, with some better, better measurements of those heifer pregnancy numbers and and things like that. So kind of all across the board, the hope is that that all those numbers, you know, everything we do and everything we select our genetics for will get a little bit better. Um, The the easy ones and the ones that we really see are are the weaning weights and the mature cow weights. Those are some pretty obvious ones. Some of the, like I said, the stability numbers and some of the the cow longevity and, and things like that are a little bit, little bit harder to harder to keep track of, and it'll take a little longer to. I don't know if they're harder to keep track of, but they'll take a little longer to know if we're how well we're doing in that regard. Well, thank you for explaining that a little more. And for those listening, you're using the Identity Beef program, correct? Correct. So, Craig, do you want to kind of talk about some of the traits that Identity Beef measures? And John, you can chime in on this too, but, you know, really what are some of those traits and those main traits that commercial cattlemen are finding value in and maybe starting with when they start doing this genetic testing? Yep. So they list, uh, they list, I believe it's 14, but I'll name them here. Birth weight, calving ease, calving ease, or calving ease direct and calving ease maternal, docility, heifer pregnancy, milk, stability, weaning weight, average daily gain, yearling weight, there's tenderness, marbling, ribeye, back fat, and carcass weight. So I didn't count them as I was doing that, but those are the, uh, those are the uh, trade areas that you get. And then you have the opportunity within the dashboard or, or the new software uh, to um, 
do your own indexes or use their indexes. So you can do a maternal. I think there's a list of, is there five indexes? And then John actually is one customer that has actually created a price ranch index that he thinks fits his operation better. And, and so you can use those indexes. I, I advise, I guess I should qualify, you know, we're an identity wholesaler. And so we sell uh, customers identity tests and then help them interpret them. Um, and, and so they can figure out where their cow herd's a little, little deficient. Uh, John's been on it the longest, um, it, not necessarily on our program. He started doing Red Navigator, I believe, and then, and then transitioned to Identity for a few years, but, or after a few years, and, um, and is a, has, has done a, a great job using it for selection of his, of his replacement females. <clears throat> Yeah, so we, we, we use, you know, I kind of look at those numbers, um, all those different fields that Craig listed off. I, when we pick our replacement females, I kind of, I kind of do it the same way I look through a bull catalog. <laughs> we we kind of, you know, you, you have those certain fields that are important to you, or maybe you think need improving. It's not always the ones you think are most important. Sometimes it's the, the things you, you think most need improving. So it's, it's a way for us to look at some of that. And, and it does, a you know, another really good Thing that we've I think we've found is the carcass traits because we always had to as a commercial producer you know we always knew that our our animals were doing pretty well because we had you know buyers coming back year after year and buying the calves or bidding on the calves and doing all those things but you never really got much for information the the feeders never like to really share that stuff with us very much they kind of protect that so in having these genetic tests we were able to see some of those carcass you know traits that we couldn't really measure before because we didn't get the information. So it, it really, it gave us a way to, to measure some of that stuff. You know, I look at, at pretty much all of the traits, um, you know, and you just kind of figure out which ones, which ones you need to focus on. And, you know, it's a good way to benchmark your herd and, and see what might, you know, gives you a direction to go when you're, when you're picking bulls as well to, you know, try to pick out bulls that'll complement the things that maybe your cows are lacking a little bit. So um, that's kind of the way we approach it and, and have used it to, to select, you know, to select things and measure and know what we need to improve on. Okay. So Craig brought up that you have kind of your own index or the price ranch index. Do you want to talk about, you know, what that process looked like for you and how you use that? Yeah, so you know, it's, we I've done it through the through the identities dashboard. Um, it works really well. It, it's you know, you pay you pretty much just go in and and kind of pick the fields that that you you know that you want to see weighted and how much you want to weight them and and kind of do it that way. And then it'll rank your animals out based on the the selections that you make. So it's really easy to use. And I kind of use a combination. I like to run. I actually run the you know the the identity indexes, the maternal one. I usually run the maternal one. I run the, I think it's the production and maternal, I think they call it. And then I also run my own index. And, and I kind of look at all at the rankings of all of those numbers and then kind of work my way through our herd. And, and so we, we kind of look at all three of those numbers and, 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 you know, see where the rankings are. And many times, even they're usually fairly similar in rankings, you know, through our, we usually test about 350 females every year, roughly. And it's, it's pretty amazing to see that those, the rankings don't move a whole lot. They might go up or down 20 or 30 spots, you know, from one index to another, but they tend to stay good. And it, it gives me a chance to, to, to look and see those ones that are in the top percentages of all of the, of, you know, all of the different indexes those are usually the ones we lean towards keeping as replacements. If they do, you know, all of the above well, <laughs> is kind of what we look for. Well, thank you for explaining that. Craig, go ahead. So if I could comment, you know, John spent a fair amount of time developing the Price Ranch Index. But, you know, so when, when I've been involved in some of these things, the rank correlations, and John does that, and, and I think it keeps him engaged and it's good to do that, but I, I don't think producers should get intimidated because the ranks correlations probably between his index and the maternal identity maternal index or some of those things when they're similar is usually pretty high. So, I mean, I tell a lot of guys, you don't need to, you, if you're not comfortable, don't make it difficult. Just, just use those indexes. They, 
They've weighted them at what they feel economically, and those guys put a lot of study into that. I mean, I think John's index, I've taken a look at it. We both have access to his dashboard. I mean, I think it probably fits him, but but I don't think producers need to feel like they have to spend a lot of effort because they're probably not going to be very far off in the end. I would agree with Craig. I, it's very, it's the nice thing with that identity dashboard. It's so easy to use. You can take those numbers and you can work with it as much as you want to or as little as you want to. And it's real easy to, to get good information without any more work at it or effort at it than you want to put into it. <laughs> so it, it's very easy to use. And I would agree with that. Yeah. And one comment John made earlier, you know, so it ranks them from one to 10 in each trait category. And, and I would tell you those trait categories are very relevant to where you want to be now. I mean, I, I, and I, John can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think he's selecting for all nines on, on yearling weight or average daily gain. Those cattle don't typically stay in an environment. He's probably looking for something a little mid range that, that has some more maternal because he's selecting for, for replacement efforts. That is correct. That is correct. And that's a nice thing with the, with the genetic stuff. I can see those and, and you can decide how important those things are to you, but that is, that is right. I, I don't select that high on some of those traits. So with that, do you want to kind of talk about what the implementation process looks like for this? Because I mean, this is unique because you have Craig on the registered side and John, you're on the commercial side. And so what does that kind of relationship look like in that process look like for starting to implement this identity beef program for me it was pretty you know it's pretty simple when as far as you know we do it through, like craig said we do it through him so it's pretty much just a phone call to craig or peggy to the office whoever's in the office and and just letting them know how many you want to test you know what what those numbers look like and they'll get they get us the tsus the the tissue, tissue sampling units and the, you know, related equipment that's super easy to take the, to the samples. It's, it's, you know, pretty much as easy as putting in an ear tag, which most all of us do. If you're even considering this, you obviously have an ear tag. <laughs> so it, uh, it's, it's very simple to do. You know, you, you just write down some numbers and kind of correlate the barcode number to the, to the number that it's on. We do it at birth, but you can also, I know some people do it at, you know, branding time, or there's different times when you can do it. Um, the only thing you need to do is just have enough lead time so that, you know, you can get those, re have time to get those results back before you have to have them to make selection decisions. Um, but other than that, it's, it's really kind of a simple process. The, the, the TSUs don't need refrigerated or anything like that. So, you, you know, you take those samples and, and then once you're done, you, you, you pretty much mail them in with kind of a list of which numbers go to which ID numbers, you know, which calf gets which barcode. And then they send them on in from there and kind of make sure the order's right. So it's, for me, it's really a, a pretty simple process. Craig, do you have anything to add on to that as sure. far as? So, yeah, the, and John's right. The TSUs, you know, so the old days of blood cards and hair, they actually charge, starting to charge more for both. And so TSUs are a really easy way to get it. We stock those and we'll send them to you and bill you for them. Uh, but then, you know, then John sends us his electronic spreadsheet. He emails it to us. You know, what Peggy's role or our role is, is that we we check it. We make sure we have all the sires because one thing John really likes is the sire identification. So we try to make sure we have all the sires that might be represented within that calf crop and, and just make sure everything's right. And then uh, we send it on to identity. It usually takes three to six weeks to return as uh, it's been towards the smaller end of that, I think, hasn't it, John? Yeah, it kind of depends on the time of year. If we yeah. get it in early, it seems like it's pretty quick. If if I don't get off, you know, get it in, get it off to you guys quick enough, sometimes it's a little longer with everybody else sending samples in. But I think about four to five weeks is about the furthest out we've probably been most of the yeah. time. So and then and then when we get the results back, I, we send them to John. Uh, he has access to them on the dashboard as well. Uh, that kind of gives him um, an idea that they're up. And then, you know, I actually take it out, send some spreadsheets to a lot of customers. That's a view. John is really familiar with the dashboard. And so he knows how to do that himself, but I still send him the spreadsheets. And then I usually call to follow up mm -hmm. and discuss, you know, where, where I think, you know, bull selection should be. And if they want advice on, 
on female selection, uh, depending on how many they did, you know, I'll give them advice there. So, so Craig, you kind of want to talk about, you know, for those other seed stock producers who are listening, what do they need to keep in mind with building these relationships with their commercial customers to get their commercial customers to start doing this testing, even if, because you're a wholesaler, so that's a different relationship, but what do other seed stock producers need to keep in mind when encouraging their customers? Well, I mean, I do think, I, I mean, I think this DNA, well, first, first of all, that seed stock producer is going to have to believe in that, that DNA is adding value. If, if he doesn't, I'm not sure this is for him. I do think it's been powerful in the customers that we've gotten to use it. That, that have used it, used to select their females, they, they can see results pretty quickly. Um, and, and so, you know, with a seed stock producer uh, that he encourages, I think it helps him figure out what bulls he should be recommending to that customer, uh, where they should be going. You know, John, John wanted to keep mature sizes in check and, and he's kind of been, you know, he feels like he's been able to do that okay or do that relatively well, have a better female in the end by, by kind of weeding out the ones that aren't quite what they should be to be replacement heifers in the herd. So then you said, you know, that seed stock producer has to see the value in the DNA. Yep. So why do you value the DNA? Well, I saw early on that, that particularly the calving ease direct and First weight predictions were right. I think a lot of the other traits are right. Jared Decker just spoke at the uh, Red Angus convention, and I, I think he said it right. It's time to quit not believing in EPDs and in particular genomically enhanced EPDs. They work. Yeah, if there's a real problem with them, it's the data that purebred producers submit and not any, not real problems with the methodology or, or, or that sort of thing. And I won't say there hasn't been errors, but uh, you know, we, we, we adopted early and felt like it was moving us forward much quicker. Uh, and so I, I really feel like um, you, you, you should be convinced, um, but I know there's always doubters within the industry. And in our industry, we have a tendency not to want to implement or use technology or be very doubtful. And I, I, think, I think now is, is the time where we got to start adapting. I mean, some of these farming techniques that they're using are just surpassing us. And, and if we want to keep cows on the land, we need to be using this stuff, in my opinion. Well, thank you for that. Now, you mentioned at the very beginning, you would be testing dead animals. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought I'd bring it up. So we're, we're so, so there might be as much to learn there as there is from the live ones, okay? And we learn a lot about the live ones, but if we could start to figure out some health or, or those sorts of things, and the problem with seed stock producers, you know, they're only collecting the top whatever. We do them all, but a lot of them are, oh, I'm only gonna do top 50%, you know, because it's gonna move their EPDs or what have you. I mean, the reality of it is we'll probably learn more, that's low hanging fruit. We'll probably learn more from the dead calves than we will, than we will from the live calves. And if we can isolate health, health traits or, or healthier calves or, or eliminate the calves that, that don't die, obviously we're gonna be in a more profitable situation. So I, I expect we're gonna start doing it. I don't expect for a year or two, there's gonna be anything done with it. I'm hoping that there's, a, I, I've suggested this idea and I'm hoping that there's a master's or a PhD student that's gonna take this up. And maybe maybe that person will hear this podcast and uh, take take that up as their as their thesis, and then we'll, we'll get a little clarification on that. But I really do think uh, you know that's data we haven't been collecting. Period, and there could be a lot of low hanging fruit within that, especially on health. Well, I think that's really interesting, and um, it'll it'll be interesting to see where that goes. And yeah, hopefully. I Someone listening wanna, does like it. <laughs> I don't want to pay for the dead calves, okay? So that's why I think I think somebody's going to have to fund this. But I, you know, when you're looking at the long game, I, I think this. I think it could be. I could be some of the more informative data we get out of DNA. Well, you can't manage what you don't measure, and in a lot of ways, data is power. So, <laughs> yep. There's a lot of there's a lot of learning there. So. 
John, looking back at all your years of doing this testing, is there anything you would have done different when you started? Uh, not a lot different, except maybe just gone in a little faster and, you know, and just dove in more than we did. Um, it took me probably four or five years to really understand, because we all have our, we're all, you know, guilty of having our favorite cow and our favorite, you know, that cow has a calf and, oh, we got to keep that cow and, or that calf, you know, as a replacement because her mom's so good. And so after it, it really took me about four or five years to really understand that I, in some regards, kind of needed to close my eyes and just look at the numbers, you know, with the exception being we still, like I said, we still look at some of them that don't fit the part that are, you know, too little, too whatever. There's still a few of them that still get kicked out for those reasons. But beyond that, we just anymore, they have to fit the profile, the genetic profile, or they don't get kept, um, kind of period. It, you know, we just close our eyes. So the only thing I would do different is probably to have started that sooner. <laughs> so <laughs> once we started doing that, um, you know, the genet the more I've the more I've really leaned on the on the DNA numbers and the genetic information we get, the more even my replacement herd has gotten. Um, and just the better, I think the better they've become. So that's what I would probably do different. Okay. So, you know, you've talked about how, when you look at the dashboard, it's simple to understand. And, but you've also talked and kind of shown that you have a good understanding of EPDs and what that data is saying. How did you begin to learn that? Because everyone's kind of in their different stages of learning to understand EPDs and use that data. So how in your years of experience, did you learn to understand that better? You know, I started doing it pretty young. My dad and my, my father and I, you know, were, were both on the operation and, and he kind of got tired of trying to pick bulls and didn't want to do it. So he kind of just handed it off to me and I kind of enjoyed numbers and looking at them. So I just, I did a lot of reading, but I think the easiest way to do it is to talk to guys like Craig or whoever it is you buy your bulls from that have a good understanding of it and just visit with them. Most, most everybody I've ever talked to are more than happy to answer a question you might have about those different fields and what those numbers mean. Um, you know, I don't, I don't pretend to understand how they calculate those numbers and I don't really need to know that. I just need to know what they mean, you know, that final result and what that means. So, you know, if you just have that conversation with somebody like Craig or, you know, whoever it is you're buying your bulls from, or, you know, people at Red Angus or whatever, you know, your breed association, whatever that is, I think that's the easiest way, best way to start to get an understanding of those numbers. And, you know, once you, once you dive into them, you find out they're not as complicated as they might appear to be when you first look at them. Craig, do you have any insight on that? Well, I think, I think it's, you know, I mean, I think you need a seed stock producer who's willing to try and understand it, who can explain it. I mean, it, it didn't come without some effort on my part to, to, you know, I was, I was, I go to BIF, Beef Improvement Federation regularly. I've been president of BIF and a director for a number of years. I mean, I participate in a lot of the Red Angus programs, but being around that stuff and really getting exposed to it. I mean, honestly, the first few years I went to BIF and listened to some of the genomic stuff, I was like, oh boy, I mean, this is complicated. And, but the more you listen and more you understand how to apply it, I think it does work. And, 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 and one of the first guys that really probably weighed with me and I'll go back to it again is it weighed in well with me, I should say, is he said, this will predict calving ease very well. And at the time we were a little, our calving ease predictions didn't seem like they were always the best. Now I'm very confident. in them. So, you know, that gave me, you know, more and more, uh, I guess, to more and more interest in learning more about about it and how to use it effectively and you know yes i talked to john I, I try to get as much outside information as i can so well great so we've covered a lot from kind of the basic understanding of why this can be important john you've talked about how it's helped improve your herd and how you've seen some roi on that but at the end of the day why does this all matter? If a commercial producer would ask you, you know, why does this all matter? What would you say? Well, I think the bottom line is that return on your investment, you know, that, that money that you're getting back. So if we're able to improve, 
you know, if I can keep a cow one more year, if I can, you know, add 10 pounds of weaning weight to that calf, or I can, you know, shrink my cow size by, you know, even 50, 60 pounds, or maybe 100 pounds, and still maintain my wean weight of that calf, all those things add up, you know, those are, those are things that, that we all, you know, benefit all of us. So, and I really think, I, I mean, I really think in the, I, I, I think the further we go and the, the more this DNA, you know, the more people start to trust it and accept it, this information, I really think, you know, from my standpoint, my, you know, my customers are the, our feedlots, you know, that's who I'm selling to. And I think they're going to start to rely on this information pretty heavily at some point, they're going to look at this and be able to predict what these calves are doing. And so if you can show them, you know, the genetic merit of your herd and the calves that you're trying to sell them, I think they're going to be worth a whole lot more to those feeders than a calf that either isn't, you know, doesn't have those traits or they don't know, you know, that way they can sure they can count on some certain, you know, characteristics of those calves that they're buying and, and know they're going to get some certain performance levels out of them. So I, th I think there's going to be a time when that is the case. And, and so I, I think that's really going to have a return at that point. Well, awesome. Thank you. Craig, do you have anything to add? to Yeah, that? The, you know, there are already supply chains who are looking at this data. And I think it's interesting, you know, Igenity has really done a good job of with their feeder index of, of educating calf buyers to, to what it might mean to them. And, and they're, I know supply chains are already have an interest in it and looking on that and looking at the identity data, even if it is on the heifer calves, um, you know, the, the heifer mates, which I think is how a guy like John leverages it best is take it on the heifers, use it as a slack replacement, but provide it because you only need to have, I think, 35% of your calves done to to, to get an identity score. Um, and so I just think that it's going to be bigger and bigger in the future is that we're going to need genetic verification one way or another. And this is likely to be one of the, one at the forefront. Well, thank you. As we wrap up today, do either of you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? I, I think as an industry, we need to keep I mean, we need to use this technology in order to, I mean, part of my deal is I wanna keep cows on grass and keep grasslands um, for obvious reasons. They don't buy many bulls if we don't have grasslands, but I think this is one way that you can increase your return on investment or profitability of your operation and consequently make you more sustainable. But, you know, I, I, I just think we gotta start, stop asking a lot of I mean we need to ask enough questions to get comfortable but at the same hand there's lots of producers using this and it works. I would kind of echo what Craig said a little bit. I think the the things right now that we're using this for is really to kind of improve the maternal side of my herd a lot but I really think where this goes in the future some of that is the efficiencies in the feeding whether that's on grass in the feedlot whatever whatever stage that is and I and I agree it's going to make it, it's going to make things a lot more you know, quote unquote, sustainable. <laughs> so I, I think, and that's not a bad thing. It, 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 even though it gets a little political, sometimes it's still a good thing. If we can make things more efficient and perform better, we're going to be, as an industry, we'll be more competitive. Um, so I, I think that's a good direction for us to be moving. Well, thank you very much for both. Of, thank you very much to both of you for being on the show today and talking about this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.